Good afternoon. You are watching the program Literature with Andrea Lohin. Please meet the young but well-known writer and poetess Irina Tsilik. First of all, she is known as a filmmaker. She is a film director that has made a number of films and participated in various festivals both in Ukraine and abroad. It's always very interesting for me to meet a person who is a writer-director. In my opinion, these are absolutely two different figures. Let's first ask our guest what her thoughts are about my assertion. Irina, if a Ukrainian poetic classical cinematographer would have survived to the present day, then you would most likely be a symbol, poetic cinema. Any of your films are extremely poetic, and any of your poetry or prose is extremely cinematic, as is visible on the pages of your works. Sometimes it seems to me that, while filming your masterpiece, you suddenly take a sheet of paper and jot down some lines. And vice versa, when you write something, you think and ask yourself, hold on a moment, how can I film this? What is more inside you, film or literature? Who are you in general, and do you feel such a balance between these two forms of art. It happens such that I am like a two-faced Janus who balances between cinema and literature. So I am right. Of course, there is a grain of truth, because when writing something, I still see what I am writing about. As for poetic cinema, then I am not sure and I even don't know, but I consider this label to be overly alarming. The famous poem about two people on their way became the symbol of your movie. However, why? Poetry and cinema go in stride in your works, so for me it's impossible to separate them. Are you a filmmaker in literature or writer in filmmaking? It's hard to say, it's really unknown what came first, the chicken or the egg, although I know what was first. The first was the poems that I began to write at the age of nine, so naturally they were quite lame. As a poetess Tsvetaeva said that it's necessary to write bad poems, like ailing from chicken pox in childhood. That was the case with me. And I didn't think about directing and filmmaking until a certain moment, because it seemed to me that my life could include only literature without cinema. I did not think about directing films. This all is quite well combined in what I do today. Sometimes cinema comes to the fore, sometimes literature does, sometimes they intersect at certain touch points, and then I create something new and formulate it. So that's my life, my mentality and the way that I think and work. Let's return to filmmaking as our main theme. We should definitely ascertain who you are – a film director, a poet or a writer, because directors see the world differently. Once I had to somehow talk to them. Let me ask you how a writer sees contemporary Ukrainian literature, because the current situation on the shooting side of Ukrainian literature, in my view, is absolutely unique. Actually, everybody knows that in Ukraine every next literary generation rejects the previous one. And it's good that there is a conflict between generations of writers. As I know, your literary parent was Oksana Zabushko, who represented the elite of adult and serious up-and-coming writers in Ukraine. It happened so that the famous ATO anthem Come Back Alive was sang by the well-known Telnyuk sisters. This also, in a certain way, was thanks to the efforts of Oksana Zabushko, this begs the question, how do you feel among the generation of literary masters? You are fairly young, quite famous and apparently quite a successful writer, but nevertheless, it's almost something closer to classical literature in Ukraine. How do you feel among the greats in this genre? How do you feel among the greats in this genre? 
You know, it's not in my nature to put someone on a pedestal, but my first book was published 10 years ago. However, I still feel like a beginner. And I like this feeling, because we all continue learning, despite the number of books I've written and the results I've achieved. I feel that much still lies ahead of me, and at the same time, I feel pride knowing that I have dialogue with my colleagues, who are much cooler than I am. As for the time being, well, this will be one way or another. Dialogue with colleagues is of great importance. I am very glad that among Ukrainian writers there are very few persons whose opinions I trust. Again, not every thought from the side should be taken close to the heart, but I'll be pleased to hear criticism of those people whom I will show my manuscripts. Based on my own life experience, I can say that it usually occurs that very simple people are the coolest ones in cinema and literature. And the cooler they are, the easier they are in personal communication with their colleagues and readers, and so on. And I'm very glad to work with such people. I'm fortunate to come together with such people. These people can teach me a great deal, and not only professionally. I mean, I can learn good lessons in life from them. Maybe it sounds pathetic, but nevertheless, I constantly watch people that move around me and prefer to draw my own conclusions about them, and myself personally. In other words, you are not afraid of them. For example, you can phone such a person and ask their opinion about your poem and... But it works, it's really amazing. But why to create such pedestals and put some body on them? In short, I'm already confused. Literary spouses in Ukraine are not rare. They are both families of writers and dynasties. Irina Tsiluk's husband is a writer. His name is Artom Chekh. The fact is that he went to serve in the army, he went to the front line and spent time in the trenches. He wrote a book during his time spent there. So let's find out how all these events influenced the literary activity of Irina Tsiluk. There was the famous story about a group of writers that went and toured around the liberated territories of the Donbass region and there they happened to meet a man who was serving in the army and fighting in the war. In my opinion, this was a ready theme and an interesting story for a feature film. Please tell me about it. Tell me about your literary family. In fact, there were some romantic dates in the frontline zone. It was a rather surrealistic story. We went all together on a literary tour around Ukraine. We had only two books with us. One of us had their own book. I had my own, and we left at the same time. We visited 27 Ukrainian cities in a month and a half. In Severodonetsk, I met with my husband. Of course, it was surrealism. Everything was strange. After all, a war in our country is also a rather strange phenomenon. In fact, the war is in its fourth year, but I'm not sure that I have gotten used to it. We have all changed. We cannot be the people we were before and we cannot write about what we wrote before. You know, I once appeared in Berlin, and one journalist asked me, you are Ukrainian writers, do you understand that the war really gave you a lot of inspiration and material, no matter how cynical it sounded? And my first reaction was, oh, really? But to some extent it's true, because a war uproots everything, and I cannot look the other way in this situation. I cannot act in this way. I do not say that poets or prose writers must write about it. But in our eyes, our reality is completely changing, and it's impossible not to talk about this. I consider poetry to be the most appropriate genre for this reality, because 
Pro still requires a distance and we need to recover before writing about what happened to us. If you are a witness of these events up close, you cannot describe them objectively. And poetry stops that moment. It preserves some emotions because we're changing very fast now. And poetry as a kind of space of freedom gives an opportunity to talk about it. As for Czech, he had a tablet there, he made some notes and then simply put them in his cuffs. He recorded everything that he faced. And after all, he published his book, Point Zero, which I consider to be fair enough and bereft of any jingoist ideas. It is not about war. The war is just scenery there, but the book tells about a man who is in a state of absurd reality, in which he has to invent some rules of the game. Thank you. I just want to say that I promise all our viewers that I will invite Irina's husband, the writer Artem Chekh, to our program to hear his point of view on this issue. I promise that I will do this. You know, maybe I'm wrong, although I do not think so. However, more and more we get sense that there is some kind of gap between the old pre-war generation of the great Ukrainian writers and the post-war young prominent war veterans, Facebook commentators, bloggers and so on. What I want to say is that Irina Tsilik is the only Ukrainian young poetess and writer who easily, naturally and beautifully entered into a rather close clan of the great Ukrainian professional writers. We will ask her about this right now. And finally, Irina, I have to ask this question. It is a unique case when a professional director must look at a situation from above, but you know it from the inside. After all, you attend various reading conferences, publishers, forums, and so on. You tour around Europe and through Ukrainian cities quite often. I want to ask you, as a film director, what is the current situation on the film set of contemporary Ukrainian literature? And what are its prospects? In your opinion, what is happening? And what can we expect in the future? We all see this, but at this point we are unable to describe it because we are not directors. Please. Being a film director, I also cannot be true to life. Nevertheless, frankly speaking, I see the literary process close up. I mean close. But I like what is happening now with Ukrainian literature, because many new publishing houses in Ukraine are really cool and competitive. There are festivals, conferences, meetings with people and personalities and authors are invited from Europe. In fact, for the last two years I have had many opportunities to travel and appear at various book fairs in Europe and Ukraine. And do you know what I like? In Ukraine, many poets began to feel like rock stars in literature, because they, I mean Jadan, are sold out. This is somehow totally unrealistic for Europe, and that's a very interesting contrast. We constantly talk about it with colleagues from other countries and from Central and Western Europe, where poets, for example, are quite well supported by the state and receive grants. But they're alone, because, after all, it's the elite. They're kind of marginalized people. They appear before no more than 10 people, according to their words. In Ukraine, the situation is completely different. I constantly see it with my own eyes. People have started attending reading events. Moreover, these are people who were far from this. And we can always confirm this fact when we tour around eastern and southern Ukraine. The halls are full of people, about 500 people, and they are new attendees. They are hedge big, alert, and they do not know how to respond, but they come anyway. And it seems to me that this need for dialogue is very acute now, because we all, the audience hall and those who appear on the stage, we all have too many questions now, and we're looking for answers. And I would like this dialogue to continue and take on new forums, so that we can reach new levels of communication and give impetus to moving forward, growth and strengthening of Ukrainian literature 
and our development. Young people are always optimistic, and this is always great. Thank you all. I'm Andrea Lachin. See you soon.